Hello, I'm Anthony David Hobbs, and I apologise, my review went wrong again. So this is Dragon Slayer Movie Review Part 2. I don't know what it is, maybe I should upload them at a different time, maybe that's why. Because the other one was very short, but anyway, this is the rest of the review. So what did I get up to? Um, well, basically, I like Dragon Slayer because it, it's a fairy tale with a twist. It sets the scene, the hero has to save a damsel in distress from a dragon... Except the the twist is he's not actually in love with the damsel in distress. He's in love with the peasant girl instead, yeah. And um, it had actors that went on to do well. Yes, Ian McDermott plays a priest in the film. He went on to play the Emperor in Return of the Jedi. Peter McNichol plays the hero called Galen, like the sorcerer's apprentice. He went on to be in Sophie's Choice, Ghostbusters 2. And the thing he's most well known for is the TV show Ally McBeal. So yes, Dragon Slayer wasn't all bad, you know. I just think as people are expecting a, a feel-good factor family film as opposed to a really grim Dark Ages tale, yeah. And um, for me, uh, the dragon's called Vermifrax. And um, uh, the movie is a bit like Jaws in that we don't see the monster throughout the film. No, we see glimpses of it and bits of it, you know. And it's not until we're well over halfway through the film that we see the monster properly. Well, it's worth the wait. Yes, it's a really impressive monster. Yes, fantastic detail and everything, yeah. And, um, yeah, when I was ten years old, um, my powers of observation, yeah, I knew, I'd seen a lot of special effects films, I knew the monster was an animated puppet when it was flying in the sky, when it was a distant shot. But when we see it up close, when it's about to incinerate the hero in the dragon cave, I thought that was a live-action, 20-foot-tall puppet. It isn't. It's an animated model. I thought, what? Yes, I found that out years later. But well, it certainly fooled me. And how can you animate the fire like that when it's breathing fire? Like, that's incredible, yeah. Dragon Slayer does deliver with special effects. They still look quite impressive even now. So, yeah, they got that bit right, yeah. And um, it's impressive when he's got the hero as a fireproof shield and all that. That's quite cool, yeah. And, um, oh, yes, back to powers of observation. <laughs> The peasant girl that the hero ends up falling in love with. At the beginning of the film, the very beginning, we see um, a young man leading a group of travellers to the house of Ulrich, the wise wizard. And um, Except it's not a young man leading them at all. It's a young woman in disguise. Because, see, in the Dark Ages, if you're a woman and you wore man's clothes, that was, that was the most convincing disguise ever. Everyone thinks you're a man, you know, straight away. No makeup on your face or anything. No, just wear man's clothes and that's a brilliant disguise. And in fact, the hero himself is fooled into thinking that she's a man you know, until a bit later in the story, yeah. So, yeah, um, powers of observation there for you, yeah. Oh, and Ralph Richardson plays the wise wizard and he was an actor I admired at the time because I liked him in that Tarzan film in the 80s. But Anyway, um, oh yes, and although I said... Dragon Slayer was made to to jump on the bandwagon, to cash in on the success of the Dungeons & Dragons board game, because Sword and Sorcery was cool at the time. But, big spoiler here, the, the wizard, he dies near the beginning, and then comes back to life as a ghost to guide the hero a bit more. Now, I'll be honest, that, that's like Obi-Wan Kenobi. That, that idea works with him, yeah. So they did borrow a few ideas from Star Wars, as well as the Sword and Sorcery genre, yeah. Peter McNichol, yeah, he does a good job playing the hero, even though he talks with an American accent, so it's sell in America. He doesn't use any American slang, though, I'm pleased to say. Yes, he does talk as if he's in that time period, yeah. When the dragon, yes, big spoiler here, eventually the hero kills the monster with sorcery at night time. And it's destroyed, it's incinerated. And then the following morning, all the people come up and they see the dead body of the dragon, but nobody knows what killed it. So they think God did it. If something's unexplained, it must be God. And therefore the king gets full credit for killing the dragon. Because, see, in those days, Europeans believed that their king was appointed by God. Therefore, if something happens and it's an act of God, the king gets full credit for doing something he didn't do. The king is hailed as the dragon slayer, even though he didn't do anything. And the hero and his girlfriend are quite disgusted by this, you know, and... Uh, they decide to leave. It is now safe to live in that village, but they decide to leave anyway, you know, because the hero didn't get the credit he deserved, yeah. So a grim tale with a bit of a grim ending. Yes, the hero triumphed, but he didn't get recognised for it, yeah. But for me, that's kind of the point. This is not your stereotypical action film. It has, it, it, it shows what it was really like to live in the Dark Ages, yeah. 
So I liked it, yeah. Anyway, okay, wrap this review up with a bit of philosophy. Clash of the Titans was released the same year, 1981, and it was criticised for using really old-fashioned special effects. Dragon Slayer used state-of-the-art, you know, they just perfected go-motion special effects. Industrial Light and Magic were using the latest special effect. Except Clash of the Titans was a hit, and Dragon Slayer was a flop. So that just goes to show it's the story that counts. I personally like both films, but there we are. Anyway, thank you for watching. I'm Anthony Hobbs, and I'm never bored.